Again, we're going to go ahead and get started. And this afternoon, we have fictional reflections of the civil rights. And uh, we have uh, to introduce our guest speaker, uh, Mr. Felix Crosby, who is an English major here in the English department at Albany State University. He'll come forth and we'll get started. Good afternoon, everyone. Anthony Grooms grew up in rural Virginia. His education at the College of William and Mary and George Mason University led him to a teaching career in Georgia, where since 1995 he taught creative writing and literature at Kennesaw State University. He is the author of Ice Poems, Trouble No More, Stories in Birmingham, a novel. His stories and poems have been published in Kalu, African American Review, Crab Orchard Review, and other literary journals and anthologies. Writing in Mellis, a critical journal of multi-ethnic uh, literature, Professor Dipchiranjan, I'm sorry, Patternack said, Trouble No More demonstrates the insider's profound knowledge of the history and struggles of African Americans while consistently managing to circumscribe a breadth of, of understanding with the tender storytelling art. Reviewing Birmingham for the Washington Post, critic Jabari Asim wrote in his insistence that the world is a tumultuous place and every soul in it suffers, this powerful resonant novel offers no consolations. Grooms offers consolations, however, in allowing us to be present at the emergence of a brave and promising talent. Grooms is a Fulbright Fellow, a Hurston Wright uh, Foundation Legacy Award finalist, an Arts Administration Fellow of the National Endowment of the Arts, and a recipient of two Lillian Smith Awards from the Southern Regional uh, Council. Both Trouble No More and Birmingham, thank you, were selected as all Georgia Reads books adopted for study in colleges. Birmingham was 2013 common book selection for Washington, D.C. Currently, Grooms is finishing a novel about black Americans in Sweden. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Anthony Grooms. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Felix, for your introduction. And uh, thank you, Dr. Hill, for inviting me to speak about something that I am uh, very, um, uh, something that's very close to my heart and really, in some ways, fundamental to my, my being, my reason for being. And thank you uh, to all of uh, Albany State University, go Rams, <laughs> for, for your participation in this wonderful uh, and I think much needed symposium on civil rights. I'm uh, very honored, frankly a bit overwhelmed, to be included on a program that honors Bernice Johnson Reagan and by extension the Albany Freedom Singers the Reverend and Mrs. Sherrod, Dr. Anderson, and the many organizers and ordinary people uh, who participated in the Albany movement. Can everyone hear me in the, in the back? Am I heard? Okay, good. This afternoon, I've been given liberty under the banner of civil rights and human rights. To this, we have come from here where to address you about storytelling. I want to talk just briefly about some recent novels and movies that are telling the story of the civil rights movement. In this regard, I want to underscore the importance of the donation of her archival papers by Mrs. Reagan to Albany State University. As a researcher, a writer of historical fiction, I can attest to the helpfulness of having primary documentation at hand. It aids enormously in getting at the truth and enables historians and writers of fiction like myself to better understand and to convey history. As you so well know, what much of what we learn, we learn through telling stories. This is an old way of transmitting knowledge, going back even before there was writing. We encounter stories everywhere, whether on cable TV news or the holy book, whether in song lyrics or in sitcoms. We hear stories, we watch them, we tell them. 
The stories I want to focus on are fictional stories that are made up. Writers of fiction often say that fiction is the great lie that tells the greater truth. It is important to remember that fiction about the civil rights movement might not present the facts of the movement in the same way that historians or journalists might. In fiction, the facts may be exaggerated, reorganized, or invented as needed to create and sustain tension or characterization and other elements of the story. In other words, the factual truth of fiction might lie in order to tell a good story. But good fiction, whether written or in film, uses the twisting of facts to support something that is more powerful, more salient than facts, and that is understanding. We may call this understanding historical understanding, for it attempts to dig behind the facts, to understand how people, ordinary or celebrity, lived during the historical period, what they thought, how they felt, their fears, and their joys. In this way, fiction can bring us to a profound historical understanding, for it is imperative to remember that history is not made of events, but it is made of people who act in events. In just a month's time, as many of you know, we will commemorate the 50th anniversary of one of the important events of the Civil Rights Movement, Selma's Bloody Sunday. Likely, our news uh, media will focus on images of police squadrons beating peaceful demonstrators, running them down from horseback and smacking them with billy clubs. It is important to remember, though, that neither Selma nor any direct action campaign, to use Martin Luther King's phrase, can be reduced to one single moment or incident. A moment like Bloody Sunday grows out of decades, some would say centuries, and I wouldn't argue with them, of oppression and humiliation. It also grows out of years of resistance. So it is important then that the recent film called Selma, directed by Ava DuVernay, at the beginning of it we see a scene in which Annie Lee Cooper attempts to register to vote at the Dallas County, Alabama courthouse. Annie Lee Cooper was a firebrand of an activist, known not only for her persistence in attempting to register to vote in Alabama, but also for socking Sheriff Jim Clark in the jaw after he continuously prodded her with his billy club. In the film, Cooper is played by none other than Oprah Winfrey, who is also one of the producers of the movie. Naturally, the film focuses on Reverend Martin Luther King, but storytelling about lesser figures like Cooper, Jimmy Lee Jackson, his mother Viola Jackson, his grandfather Cager Lee, broadens the civil rights story including these lesser known activists suggest appropriately that the leadership of the civil rights movement was supported by an enthusiastic, if sometimes small, grassroots movement. It was, after all, Jimmy Lee Jackson's death at the hands of Alabama State Patrolman James Fowler that inspired the Bloody Sunday March. DuVernay's film includes characters playing a host of civil rights luminaries, such as the inestimable John Lewis, uh, whom we've mentioned earlier in the conference. Reverends James Orange and James Bevel are portrayed in the movie, as well as Diane Nash. Still, by including Mrs. Cooper, the Jacksons, and Mr. Lee, the film gives, uh, gives context to the story of Bloody Sunday. 
Doing so does not diminish the heroism of Reverend King, but it places him in a community. He is not viewed as a lone hero, as traditionally heroes, especially in movies, are portrayed, but rather a person who is a part of a community. But keep in mind that Selma is a dramatic movie, not a documentary. It is a movie made to entertain first and to inform secondarily. Given that it is a motion picture, Selma imparts a truthful understanding of the civil rights movement, at least from the perspective of the activist community. At times, the movie runs as a kind of checklist of events and persona. It is as if DuVernay wanted to make sure that every aspect of the Selma movement from Malcolm X's meeting with Coretta Scott King to the murders of Reverend James Reeb and Mrs. Viola Liozzo are shown. In some scenes, it turns analytical, even providing an analysis of Sheriff, Sheriff Laurie Pritchett's strategies in the Albany movement. But the film is not without controversy. And, and, and has earned detractors for its portrayal of President Lyndon Baines Johnson. The film suggests that Johnson was a reluctant supporter of the Voting Rights Act and delayed proposing it. In particular, Joseph A. Califano, a special assistant to President Johnson at the time, later Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare under President Jimmy Carter, attacked the film. Califano says, the film falsely portrays President Johnson as being at odds with Martin Luther King and even using the FBI to discredit him. As only reluctantly being behind the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and as opposed to Sel the Selma March itself, Califano argues in the uh, Washington Post. He goes on to say, contrary to the portrait painted by Selma, Lyndon Johnson and Martin Luther King were partners in the effort. Johnson was enthusiastic about the voting rights, uh, about voting rights and the president urged King to find a place like Selma to lead a major demonstration. Califano presents a strong case with references to the archival record. But likely, he overstates his case when he asserts, in fact, Selma was LBJ's idea. Sorry. Uh, this statement has been roundly ridiculed as the historical record shows that activists in Selma were organizing as early as two years before the president became involved. The controversy highlights several important facts about telling stories about our history. For one, questions are raised about how much license a director and writers have with what we call the historical record. After all, DuVernay's Selma is a dramatic picture, a historical fiction, not a documentary. Califano's criticism, as sharp as it is, certainly would have been damning if it were made of a documentary, for example, a film by Stanley Nelson, who seems to have taken up the role of civil rights documentarian from Henry Hampton of Eyes on the Prize. As a fiction writer, I think that fiction comes before the facts. After all, the writer and filmmaker are charged with telling an engaging story. But we are also charged with telling an emotionally truthful story, what I call historical understanding. And I think DuVernay achieves this. Perhaps her portrayal of Johnson's reluctance reflects the frustration of activists on the slow movement of the federal government in general on the issue of civil rights. After all, the call for a voting rights bill is being made 100 years 
after the end of slavery. Finally, DuVernay does credit Johnson's role in passing the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act before that. She even portrays the speech in which LBJ famously quotes the civil rights mantra, we shall overcome. Another aspect of this controversy caught up in Califano's assertion that Selma was Johnson's idea is more complicated and is, and is related to what I see as a tussle in our storytelling of the civil rights movement. And that is a conflict about who is portrayed in the role of hero and who is cast as villain. Just as a very quick aside, we have here uh, David Oyelowo and Carmen Injogo, who play the roles of uh, Dr. and Mrs. King. Uh, it is interesting to note that they're not African Americans, but rather um, uh, British citizens of Nigerian uh, uh, heritage. Uh, I, t I think that the fine actors, and I see no reason why Nigerian British cannot play African American roles, as certainly we've seen African Americans play African roles. The problem is that uh, David Oyelowo and, uh, and uh, another African British writer, uh, actor, uh, Tandy Newton, in various statements have said that it is a fact that they are not African American that somehow frees them to pay, play the African American role, that they don't carry the baggage of African American culture, uh, or rather the baggage of the, the, the oppression of African Americans. And I take issue with that idea, uh, the idea that, um, that somehow, uh, if you take the argument to its illogical conclusion, that somehow African Americans cannot play African American roles. Nonetheless, um, uh, both actors, I think, portray the kings in a tremendous, uh, 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 tr uh, tremendously well and, and uh, that there's no reason why Africans cannot play African American roles. It is unfortunate, however, that a few major motion pictures impart a sense of the historical uh, understanding of the civil rights movement and Jim Crow era, uh, um, and Jim Crow eras. And none is more disappointing in that regard than The Help, the 2011 film adapted from the 2009 novel by the, by the same name, uh, the novel written by Catherine Stockett. As entertaining as it is, the movie misdirects the viewer's attention away from the real deprivations and humiliations of Jim Crow and refocuses us on a conflict over the use of toilets by black servants in their white employers' homes. How many of you have seen The Help? Yeah. How many of you like The Help? A little, a little a fewer. And when I'm finished, no one will. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> That's my goal, not really. In an open statement on a listserv associated with the Oral History Association, several prominent black women historians wrote, despite efforts to market the book and the film as a progressive story of triumph over racial injustice, the help it distorts, ignores, and trivializes the experiences of black domestic workers. Having grown up with a mother and aunts who held similar positions as those portrayed by the maids in The Help, I feel strongly that the story, which ostensibly gives voices to these women, treats their concerns superficially without any exploration in depth of their lives and inner thoughts beyond how they respond to their white employers and the white world. The book and movie alike follow the lives of three women, two African-American maids and 
uh, who are working for white families in Jackson, Mississippi in 1962 and 63, and the daughter of a prominent white family, a recent college graduate who is finding a place for herself in the world as a writer. The film is woefully silent on the rich and vibrant history of black civil rights activists in Mississippi, the open statement says. Granted, the assassination of Megger Evers gets some attention. However, Evers' assassination sends Jackson's black community frantically scurrying in the streets in utter chaos and disorganized confusion, a far cry from the courage demonstrated by the black men and women who continued his fight. Portraying the most dangerous racist in 1960s Mississippi as a group of attractive, well-dressed society women, while ignoring the reign of terror perpetuated by the Ku Klux Klan and the White Citizens Council, limits racial injustice to individual acts of meanness. And this is from the black historian uh, women's um, statement. I like very much that the historians use the term meanness. The word reflects well on the overall effect of the film to trivialize the deprivations and violence perpetuated against African Americans during the period. Further, the Help's portrayal of the Civil Rights Movement misrepresents the history of the Civil Rights Movement and does not impart a truthful historical understanding of the times. As the statement points out, it portrays a black community in disarray, not one which is about to organize for two of the most intense civil rights campaigns of the period, the Freedom Summer Project and Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. Whereas I cannot endorse the film, I do not dismiss it. Its popularity means that its version of the civil rights story is the one that many Americans will learn about. The book has sold a reported three million copies, and I presume some of them have been read. And the movie was the 13th top grossing movie of 2011 at nearly $170 million. What this story tells has had a strong impact on how Americans and even African Americans understand the civil rights movement. It is incumbent, therefore, upon those of us who are scholars, those of us who attend symposiums on civil rights and human rights, to encounter, to counter the impression of stories like The Help by offering fair and balanced critique and by complicating the oversimplicity of such stories. The Help, though, isn't alone in its misguidance on the history of the civil rights movement. Likely you are aware of the controversy over Mississippi burning, yes? Uh, the 1988 film directed by Alan Parker. This story pushes the FBI into a role of hero and savior uh, of, uh, of civil rights activists during the Freedom Summer. In doing so, like the help, it falls into a category that scholars call race redemption narrative. In this kind of story, a white person is portrayed in the role of hero on the issue of black civil rights. And by contrast, blacks are often portrayed as having little initiative, little agency for advancing our own cause. I hasten to say that we can make a roll call of white supporters of the civil rights movement. Still, they do not number sufficiently to equal the preponderant presence that they have in film and fiction. Especially, we do not see Southern whites taking up the cause of black civil rights in the numbers proportionate to their representation in film and fiction. What this kind of story does is to undermine the undeniable fact that the civil rights movement was inspired by, organized by, and sustained by Southern black Americans. 
An unofficial count suggests that well over 100 novels published in the last 40 years include some reference to the civil rights movement. Certainly, all of these are not race redemption novels, but many are. Some, for instance, Rosalind Brown's Civil Wars or Alice Walker's Meridian are complicated reflections on the period. But many, like Sina Jeter Nasloon's Four Spirits, in spite of intentions to present a progressive story, indulge in nothing less than wishful thinking or fantasy on the issue of race redemption. Incidentally, I have an issue with the term redemption, which means to pay for something. Often what we, what we mean when we say that uh, a movie or a novel is redemptive is that somehow it offers salvation. We forget that you have to pay the price before you can get the salvation. Nasloon's novel is set during the time of the Birmingham movement in 1963 and in the year just after. The novel is told from multiple perspectives, both blacks and whites, male and female, civil rights supporters, white reactionaries. The effect is that it creates a portrait of the community of Birmingham during the period, and this, I think, is a worthwhile and well done aspect of the novel. In spite of its multivocalism, the novel's main character is a young southern white woman, Stella Silver, who, like Nasloon, is a student at Birmingham Southern College. In the first sections of the story, Stella is merely an interested observer of the civil rights demonstrations and does not participate in the demonstrations in any way. In fact, it is not the demonstrations or her relationships with blacks that bring her into alignment with the goals of the movement as much as it is the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. The day of the assassination is portrayed in a long episode in which the protagonist is also contriving to get birth control pills. The conjunction of the two events, one political, one personal and feminist, suggests a character who is struggling to position herself as a progressive person as the society around her becomes more uncertain. In the final section of the book, readers find Stella and another white woman, Catherine Cartwright, teaching in a community school, a kind of freedom school, on the campus of Miles College, Birmingham's HBCU. This event mirrors Nasloon's own experience. So the first three quarters of the novel impart a reasonable rendering of the tensions of the times and promotes a truthful historical understanding through the lens of fiction. But for either reasons of building a climactic ending for the story or in an attempt to seek so-called redemption for some of the white characters, the story ends with Catherine, the white friend, leading a sit-in in a at a lunch counter called the White Palace. When the policemen attack Catherine with a cattle prod, Christine, a black demonstrator, attacks the policeman. Quoting from Nasloon's novel, quick as a majorette, Christine grabbed the shaft of the prod, twirled it, and rammed the electric end into the policeman's stomach. The result of this action is that Catherine, Christine, and two other black demonstrators are killed. An another, anyone familiar with the history of Birmingham movement knows this describes a wholly fictional event. Nonetheless, the necessity of such a sit-in in Birmingham in 1964 is evident. The city had revoked its segregation laws the year before and the Civil Rights Act of 1964 had passed Congress in July, still restaurants like Ollie's Barbecue banned black diners until the Supreme Court ruled against it later in 64. The issue I take with the scene is that it is led by a white woman when in the history of the Civil Rights Movement from Virginia to Texas, 
we see no such example. It was not whites who led such uh, sit-ins, though many participated. Further, the story tells us that Birmingham police attacked the white woman, a highly likely occurrence given the reputation of Birmingham's police department at the time. But Nasloon's portrayal of the black woman Christine attacking the police, even though she does it to protect Catherine, who is wheelchair bound, misrepresents the tactics of the sit-in. Sit-in participants were dedicated to nonviolence as a strategy, if not as a philosophy. They were trained to withstand the assault of the police without resorting to violence in return. Understanding the strategy of nonviolence is key to understanding the major events of the movement. Naslon portrays her civil rights activist as impetuous, lacking discipline, and lacking strategy. In, a, in an interview published uh, at the back of the paperback edition of her novel, Naslun says that Four Spirits is based on the history of the civil rights movement. While writing the historical events, she, she writes, I recreate them with the eyes of the fictive, through the eyes of the fictive characters. My intention is to be true to the character as much as to the event, because we all have different perceptions of things. When I handle characters, I try to make my depiction of them as accurate as possible. No writer of historical fiction can argue with these intentions, and I believe that Nasloon is attempting to achieve this artistic vision by her portrayal of her characters and events. In the author's note of the same edition, she specifically notes the lunch counter scene. The event at the White Palace, she writes, is meant to stand not for any particular historical event, but to suggest some of the many atrocities that occurred. In effect, she's saying that the White Palace lunch counter sit-in scene is meant to be a representative event a way of showing what would usually happen at a sit-in, as well as to honor many of the martyrs of the movement. As a representative scene, of course, it misrepresents and does not impart a truthful understanding of the strategies and actions of the civil rights protesters at lunch counters. Instead, it undermines this understanding. Near the end of the novel, the civil rights workers are funeralized at a common service in a black church. So again, Naslun twists the historical understanding since it is very unlikely that a white woman would have been funeralized along with three blacks in Birmingham in 1964. In fact, what the historical record shows is that Elmwood Cemetery should not, would not integrate until 1970 after the family of Billy Terry Jr., a 20-year-old soldier killed in the Vietnam War, sued and won in federal court. Remember, too, that in 1965, the year after the, year, the, the setting of Nasdun's novel, Mississippi Jim Crow laws forbade the Schwerner and Cheney families from burying the, the murdered civil rights workers in the same cemetery. Nasloon's funeral scene rings untrue, not only because there's absolutely no media following the, the killings of four civil rights uh, activists, but also because it overemphasizes the ability of whites to cross Jim Crow barriers. Likely, Nasloon wants to portray a cathartic and unifying event for the characters of the novel. This purpose is achieved. But the scene also misdirects our historical understanding because it portrays greater social fluidity in Birmingham in the 1960s than was possible, and it promotes a heroism and an idealism which is unwarranted by the historical record. Even so, I invite readers to pick up Nasloon's book, engage with it. Uh, there is uh, there's much to learn from the novel, I think, 
but a reader who is looking for historical truth in, uh, in it should be wary. The reader should not look to novels for historical fact, but for emotional texture, for an understanding of the tenor of the times. This is what historical novels as a class can do better than works by historians, which are often driven by academic analysis. In addition, the race redemption novels and films, we have those which seem to undermine the understanding of the, um, which seem to undermine the understanding of the civil rights uh, story. Famously, I will, and I will not elaborate here, John Grisham's A Time to Kill, a novel and movie, leaves audiences with the notion that the effect of the civil rights movement is that black men may now lynch white men with impunity. Similarly, Deborah Johnson's The Secret of Magic uh, may be interpreted this way. The novel, which was published last year, is well written, and again, I suggest it should be read, but with some wariness about its ending. Wonderfully, the story introduces a black law student, Regina Robichard, who um, works for the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Regina is sent to Mississippi to investigate the murder of a black World War II veteran. The veteran refuses to give up his seat on a bus to a German prisoner of war. He's dragged from the bus in uniform and shot to death. Unusual for civil rights fiction, Thurgood Marshall is uh, portrayed as a minor character in this book. He encourages Regina to travel from New York to Mississippi to represent the Legal Defense Fund. As an investigator, Regina is placed in an extraordinarily uh, ironic position. It doesn't take her long to discover who the murderers are, but of course, in 1940s Mississippi, there is little chance that even the Legal Defense Fund can bring about justice. This could have been the point of the novel, but instead it turns to a revenge plot in which we see Willie Willie, the father of the murdered uh, veteran, lynch the perpetrator and get away. Presumably, Willie Willie escapes to the north, but the novel is ambiguous about this. In this turn, the novel sends an awkward message about Jim Crow and the civil rights movement periods. Certainly, African Americans did not always let ourselves be victimized without resistance. We have many stories of African Americans acting in self-defense against white marauders. But, to my knowledge, and I do learn something every day, particularly at conferences like this, no African American ever perpetrated a revenge lynching, much less one which the Legal Defense Fund knows about and lets pass. Like Nez Loon's uh, Four Spirits, uh, Johnson's The Secret of Magic promotes a racial fantasy in order to satisfy its climax. In our so-called post-racial era, writers and filmmakers might dream of black revenge on white racists of the Jim Crow period. We might cheer when Django, you've seen this movie, yes? You know, the gun-slinging ex-slave played by Jamie Foxx in Quentin Tarantino's Django Unchained kills the enslavers, but our cheering belongs to a Jim Crow South of Hollywood, not the world of historical record. I must say here it is with reluctance that I critique my fellow novelist. Writing a novel is difficult work. Writing a novel that will be published in the current overly commercial market uh, what I call Holly York, makes the process even harder. I do not say to you that you shouldn't read these novels, only that you should read them warily. Ask of them, how is this story conveying a truthful depiction of the civil rights movement? It is in this light that I mention 
Bernice McFadden's Gathering of Waters, published in 2012. The novel spans Mississippi history from the 1927 Great Flood to the post-civil rights movement period. It is a supernatural novel that follows the spirit of a rather scandalous black woman, Esther, a prostitute and swindler. Esther's spirit possesses several other characters, much to their discomfiture. But finally, she comes to possess a child, none other than J.W. Milam, one of the confessed murderers of Emmett Till. Here enters the most profoundly difficult situation for the novel, as it suggests that the murderer of Emmett Till is guided by the spirit of a black woman. In McFadden's story, Milam dies as a child and comes back to life. His mother refers to him as her Jesus child. McFadden's narrator tells us that the culprit in the resurrection of J.W. Milam is none other than Esther. Later, we are told that Milam had been a sweet child, but, quoting, after he died, he came back again, he was different. J.W. was suddenly fond of torturing living things. Whether Esther is controlling J.W.'s actions is ambiguous, but she is responsible for his return to life, suggesting that she too is culpable in the murder of Till. The novel goes on to follow the spirit of Emmett Till in what I think is an innovative treatment of the Till story, yet it is diff difficult for me to get around the idea that Till is murdered by a man possessed by the spirit of a black woman. In making this episode a part of her novel, McFadden voids an opportunity to attempt to understand better the feelings, perhaps the insecurities or delusions of white supremacy or the misguided sense of masculinity that drive Milam to commit the murder. It is a missed opportunity for the storyteller to impart historical understanding. I've mentioned several stories, films and novels, uh, and there are many, many more. Uh, and I've mentioned some that I feel fall short of telling the, the civil rights story in an insightful and understanding way. But I want to leave you with suggestions for a few recent works that give us some enlightenment. I begin with an old book. Uh, this is William Heath's The Children Bob Moses Led. This story is told by a white participant in the Freedom Summer, and it strikes me as one which explores very well the uncertainties and tensions of the period. Very high on my list is Like Trees Walking by Ravi Howard. Set in Mobile, Alabama, the novel looks at the black community as it reacts to the Michael Donnell lynching in 1981. Not only does this novel portray the pain, anger, and uncertainty of the community, it reinforces the fact that the civil rights movement is still relevant, a fact that has become even more relevant since the publication of this novel as we witness the Black Lives Matter demonstrations all across the country. Howard's most recent novel is also worthy of attention. It's called Driving the King. Uh, it was published um, just last month. Uh, Driving the King is set during the early months of the Montgomery bus boycott. The king in this case is Nat King Cole. <laughs> The story is told by a character who is Cole's driver and bodyguard. Uh, though Howard plays very, very loose with the historical fact, for example, he places Cole in Montgomery during the time of the boycott, the emotional tone of the novel is spot on. Howard is a native of Montgomery and grew up among many of the participants of the boycott. He renders his characters justly, neither exaggerating their heroism nor undermining their conviction. They are ordinary people that we know who are now engaged in an extraordinary movement. What I've found from teaching 
uh, stories and uh, novels and movies about the civil that reflect on the civil rights movement um, is that there is a, a broad range. Uh, popular film tends towards the the race redemption um, theme as uh, as well as uh, many novels uh, and also uh, in film we see the revenge uh, theme. But there are many uh, uh, stories by literary writers that uh, uh, approach the subject in great, uh, with great sensitivity and understanding. I recommend two anthologies that collect many of these stories. They are Margaret Witt's Short Stories of the Civil Rights Movement and Julie Buckner Armstrong's The Civil Rights Reader. These anthologies include stories by Alice Walker, ZZ Packer, Rosalind Brown, Natalie Patesh, James Baldwin, Henry Dumas, and many, many others. Where do we go in our storytelling from here? You have a role to play in how those stories are told. For novels and movies both come through us through commercial enterprises. It is unfortunate to say that though there are divisions of corporate publishing houses that are dedicated to publishing stories about African Americans, there is no African American publishing house of national reach. In addition, there are but a handful of African Americans who work in commercial publishing. It is then no wonder that the idea that there are, that there is little or no market for literary fiction about and by African Americans persists. The consequence of this belief is that few stories by black literary readers are published. Therefore, it is incumbent upon you to buy books by African American writers and about African Americans. Go to the movies by and about African Americans. We've marched at Selma for voting rights, and I hope that you exercise those voting rights. But we must also march to the bookstores and march to the movie houses and vote with your dollars for stories that tell truthfully about our past. We owe that much to our heroes like Miss Reagan, Dr. Anderson, and the Sherrods, and many, many others. I thank you for your attention and your time.